I welcome one and all to this uh, session four in oculoplasty, all in a day's work. Uh, maybe we should wait for two more minutes. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Dr. Millen. Because, yeah, Dr. Join. Millen has to join. Join. So I think yeah, we'll just wait. Hi, I'm here. This is Dr. I Millen. Thought so. I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, sir. Uh, Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining us. I just listen to your talk in the morning. My pleasure. I'm on a phone. I'll connect oh. exactly when my talk oh. is around. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think we can start in that case, uh, Dr. Divya. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Anjali, uh, she is a orbit oculoplasty specialist uh, working at Nara and Netralia, Bangalore. Uh, she's going to talk to us on periocular dystonia and its management. Hi, Dr. Divya. My presentation is already uploaded yesterday. You could play from there. Uh, yeah. Good noon to all. Thanking the organizers for this opportunity to present virtually with the safety concerns of Omicron looming. Periocular dystonias. These are common chronic involution, sorry, involuntary facial movement disorders with different etiology and pathophysiology that causes social and communication discomfort and restrict work and daily living capability. Peripherospasm. Now, this is a primary adult onset focal dystonia characterized by involuntary closure of the eyelids and spasms of the orbicularis oculi muscles. Over time, some patients with blepharospasm develop oral mandibular dystonia, which involves involuntary lower facial and masticatory movements, including lip pursing, chewing, and jaw opening and clenching. This is a lady with severe blepharospasm with inability to open her eyes. The spread to contagious muscles is very common, highest during initial three to five years of onset. The most common regions for first spread are the oromandibular region. Increased spread risk was associated with positive family history. Sensory tricks. These are the sensory stimuli learned by the patients to elevate the dystonias in the form of touching above the eyes singing, humming, and talking. Spontaneous remissions are rare and seen in less than 10% and tend to occur in the first five years of symptom onset. Some of the patients have difficulty in opening the lid after cessation of the spasmodic episode. These are the associated apraxia of lid opening. The severity of blepharospasm is graded using the Jankovic rating scale. It is divided into two sections. The first section grades the severity, Zero is no increase in blinking. One is increased blinking only on external stimuli. Two is mild but spontaneous. Three is moderate and mildly incapacitating. Four is severe incapacitating. The second section scores a frequency of blepharospasm. Zero is no increased blink frequency. One is mildly increased. Two is eyelid fluttering lasting less than one second duration. Three spasms lasting for more than one second. But eyes open more than 50% of the waking hours. Four is functionally blind due to persistent spasm for more than 50% of the waking hours. A meek syndrome. Now, this is a combination of blepharospasm and involuntary movements of the lower facial and masticatory or jaw muscles, including the tongue or oromandibular dystonia. Now, this is a patient with the characteristic features of meek syndrome. The average Age of onset for blepharospasm is around 55 years and a couple of years earlier in oromandibular dystonia. Women are more at risk than men because of specific estrogen receptors influencing involuntary motor function. Family history is seen in 10% of the cases. The pathophysiology is not clear enough. Some evidence suggests involvement of the striatum, whose activity is modulated by the dopaminergic system. A recent study suggests environmental triggers and genetic predisposing causing plastic changes and reduced cortical inhibition. Secondary causes of dystonia include medications, trauma, stroke, demyelination, hypoxia, kernicterus, normal pressure hydrocephalus or tumor in the basal ganglia or brainstem. The hemifacial spasm. In contrast to blepharospasm, Hemifacial spasm is not a dystonia, but rather a peripheral myoclonus. 
It includes unilateral, tonic, or clonic contractions of facial expression muscles and orbicularis oculi. Onset is after third decade of life. Women are more affected. Samson Medical Center, or the SMC grading system, is a four-point system which grades hemifacial spasm into one, localized spasm of the periocular area, two, involuntary movements spreading to other parts of ipsilateral face, three, is interference with vision due to frequent tonic spasms, and four, disfiguring asymmetry with continuous contractions of the muscles. Primary causes are due to compression of seventh nerve by vascular structure or rarely mass lesion leading to local irritation and focal demyelination. Secondary causes are due to facial nerve or brainstem damage and from any other cause such as stroke, infection, trauma, tumor, or inflammatory condition such as Bell's palsy. Most cases are primary in a one, sorry, in a four is to one ratio. The clinicians in concurrence with a neurologist and following a thorough neurological evaluation can start botulinum toxin. It was, it was first used for the treatment of idiopathic blepharospasm and is currently the preferred treatment for blepharospasm and Meek syndrome due to its high efficacy and few side effects. The toxin has been approved by the US Food and Drug Administration for the treatment of blepharospasm. The toxin has been a standard of care since 1989. The benefits are temporary, requiring multiple injections with increments. Must rule out medication-induced secondary dystonia or tardive dystonia to reduce complications and synergistic effect with botulinum toxin. Dose of the injections are depending on the extent of involvement and severity. The side effects too are temporary. As per the study, no difference in objective or subjective measures were found between Botox from Allergan and zeomin from Merck in, in benign essential blepharospasm. A regional variant, Botogene, from Biomedic Private Limited, Ghaziabad, UP in India, was also found to be safe and effective in primary medical dystonias. Injection sites for blepharospasm include the frontalis, corrugator supercilii, procerus, levator, and orbicularis oculi. And using the first time, Injection should use minimum site, minimum effective starting dose to prevent side effects such as excessive focal muscle weakness. Injection site options for oromandibular dystonias are frontalis, temporalis, orbicularis oculi, levator, lateral pterygoid, and masseter. Site of injection for hemifacial spasm include corrugator supercilii, procedus, orbicularis oculi, zygomatic is minor and major, depressor angular oris, and mentalis. This is a patient following the toxin for the left side hemifacial spasm with effective weakness on the injected site. 10 days later, still showing localized focal spasms, emphasizing targeted chemodenervation and titrations with top ups. Oral medications as primary therapy when relative contraindications exist. Patients with lid and lower facial components could, besides botulinum toxin, be treated with oral medications. The current, the different medications are anticholinergics, benzodiazepines, GABA receptor agonists, dopamine precursors, dopamine receptor agonist, and anticonvulsants. As per the authors, the effect of oral medication is, is at best modest. They're used limited by systemic side effects, and there are no definitive conclusions on which patients may get benefited. Surgical management is an option for patients who are unresponsive to the conventional drugs. Myectomy, which is near total dissection of the periorbital muscle, results in long-term improvement and can also be done with associated apraxia of lid opening. However, this is not the favored therapeutic strategy owing to post-operative complications such as inflammation, aesthetic issues, hematoma, and exposure keratitis, among others. Deep brain stimulation, or DBS, is gaining increasing attention in recent years as a treatment option for intractable dystonia. Its blepharospasm is associated with other periocular changes, including brotosis, blepharotosis, and, and dermatochalysis, which are inadequate which are inadequately addressed by orbicularis stripping, 
A variety of non-orbicularis stripping periocular procedures can reduce the compaction of the upper eyelid space and significantly improve the symptoms. To sum up, the future direction, in the words of the author, is for a wide genome analytical approach to reveal novel disease markers and potential therapeutic targets through more effective drugs to enhance clinical relief. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anjali. That was a wonderful presentation. Coming up next, we have the uh, surgical correction of ptosis by Dr. Shivyogi, uh, who's an oculoplasty uh, surgeon in Dawangere and also my senior. We welcome you, sir. Yeah, hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I, th uh, thank you. I can see Divya, Chinmay, Anjali. Hey, all of you. Nice catching up. Uh, Dr. Ishan is there. Yeah, uh, my presentation is already recorded. Can you play the presentation? Good afternoon. Uh, I thank QS and the Chairman Scientific Committee for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk on surgical management of ptosis. Uh, ptosis uh, uh, is a procedure where you should know the anatomy lead anatomy of the elevator palpebra superioris have a good outcome uh, for all ptosis surgeries. Particular care must be taken uh, in assessment as not all ptosis surgery uh, require a correction. The amount of ptosis and degree of levator function are the two most important parameters uh, to look for while deciding the ptosis surgery. The other important uh, findings are Bell's phenomena and corneal sensation. The indications for ptosis surgery are as follows. The number one and most uh, practical indication is amblopia, the degree of amblopia. And the number two is abnormal head posture. Number three is uh, visual field loss detected in a visual field test. And the last but not the least is a cosmetic purpose. Many surgeries have been done in the past, uh, like fastenal servet procedure, levator resection, or aponeurosis reattachment, bro suspension, also called as frontalis sling, and mullerectomy. Among these two, the levator resection and the bro suspension are the most commonly done procedures. Fastenal servet surgery includes resection of upper tarsal border along uh, with its attached mulla muscle and conjunctiva. The indication for fossil survey is mild congenital ptosis of 1 to 2 millimeters with good levator function that is more than 10 millimeters. Horner syndrome, mild involutional ptosis not associated with clear opneurotic defect, mild residual uh, ptosis following a, res uh, following a levator resection. The other surgery which is most commonly done is uh, the levator resection. The indications are like mild, mild to moderate congenital ptosis having a Good LPS action more than six millimeters, resurgery for undercorrected congenital ptosis or a, a, a aponeurotic ptosis where the LPS action is more than six to eight millimeters. The levator resection can be done through an anterior approach and a posterior approach. The anterior approach is called as Everbush uh, surgery, which is depicted in the uh, right upper uh, slide. Uh, and the posterior approach is a blastoist procedure, which is depicted in the left lower uh, picture. The most, uh, two most commonly used methods to estimate the amount of levator resection uh, necessary to correct the ptosis uh, are the Burke's rule and the Beard's rule. But uh, I, I prefer to correct uh, on the table um, depending upon the preoperative lid position uh, and that is the most appropriate way I believe. This is a, 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 this is a patient with mild to moderate uh, um, uh, ptosis which is being uh, uh, performed here. A levator resection is being done. The skin incision is put, horizontal skin incision from, a ten from the lid margin. A dissection is carried out to separate the orbicularis from the LPS. And the LPS is uh, separated and it is reattached back to the tarsal plate. So you can see now the sutures being taken from uh, the uh, levator palpebra superioris aponeurosis and uh, it is uh, tucked on to the, the fiber structure which is the tarsal plate. And uh, the post-operative picture will be something uh, which will be seen. 
like this. So this is immediate next day post operative picture. You can see the lid, normal lid contour with the sutures in place, little mild uh, lower lid edema and upper lid edema, which will vanish as the day progresses. The, the next um, uh, su surgery is the bro suspension, also called as frontalis sling. The indications for this surgery are severe congenital ptosis with uh, less than four millimeters of LPS action, a failed multiple failed levator surgeries, uh, Marcus gun jaw winking phenomena, blepharophimosis, epicanthus inversus syndrome, and acquietosis with poor, uh, very poor levator function. You can try bro suspension. Uh, here is a video uh, to uh, show you how the bro suspension or the Fox Pentagon approach is performed. Uh, five major incisions are placed, one on the forehead, the other two on the bro, and the other two on the lid margin. And uh, this is the silicon rod used to pass through these uh, incisions, starting with the forehead incision, then the bro incision, then the lid margin incision. So in a fashion of pentagon, uh, these, uh, uh, this silicon rod is passed. And the correction is done uh, through the main uh, incision by passing by when the silicon rod is passed through the sleeve. So you can see now uh, the, the, the rod is being placed on the uh, uh, brow, then it goes to the forehead. So once it is once it comes out of the uh, forehead, it, it is made to pass through a sleeve, silicone sleeve, and then this sleeve is buried below the galea pneumatica so that it should not get exposed. Right, so that is about the brow suspension. Uh, rule of thumb, the lid will rise by 1 to 2 millimeters if the levator function is more than 7 millimeters and will drop by 1 or 2 millimeters if the function is less than 7 millimeters. The aim is to achieve the lid level uh, after surgery around 1 to 3 millimeters from the upper limbus depending upon the levator function. The take home, take home message from all these procedures is the postnatal cervical operation is appropriate only if the levator function is at least 10 millimeters and there is one or two millimeters of process in such um, a scenario it is useful. A levator resection is suitable for uh, the surgery which is uh, when the levator function is uh, better than six or eight millimeters. A bro suspension is the only procedure which will give a lasting correction if the levator function is less than four millimeter as in case of congenital ptosis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shivyogi, yeah, for the wonderful yeah, sorry presentation. To, sorry to uh, interrupt. Uh, the, the second procedure which was shown was a frontalis sling, that is Fox Pentagon approach. Uh, it has been spelled as bro suspension. Thank you. And yeah, now uh, we can move on to the third uh, presentation by Dr. Raghuraj Hegde, who is the orbit and oculoplasty consultant at Manipal Hospital, Bangalore, and also uh, faculty at uh, Kempegowda Institute of Medical Sciences. He's going to talk to us about orbital fractures. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm be talking about orbital fractures. Um, I'll be giving a brief overview of the uh, entire spectrum of orbital fractures. Uh, since I'm short of time, uh, this is uh, and orbital fractures is a very large topic. I'll just uh, go briefly through all the fractures. Uh, 30 to 40 percent of all facial fractures involve the orbit. Uh, our broad fractures, even though we see it commonly in our practice, uh, it's only a small subset of uh, all the facial fractures. Uh, it is also important not to see the orbit as um, in isolation from the rest of the facial skeleton. Open rims uh, act as uh, blue in this photograph. Uh, a practical classification of the orbital fractures is the simple uh, blowout or blowing fractures where only the orbital walls are involved and not the frame. And uh, the orbital zygomatic fractures or the classical tripod fracture or the quadripod fracture where the impact is right on the uh, mylar bone of the uh, face. Uh, the nasal orbital ethmoidal fractures or the NOE fractures where the uh, impact is right on the uh, nasal side or the upper mid face. Uh, complex fractures where there is no clear pattern, uh, uh, one to uh, all the four uh, walls of the orbit can be involved. 
uh, blowout uh, fractures have two main mechanisms. One is direct impact to the globe where the intraorbital pressure increases and there is a giveaway of the uh, floor of the orbit. Uh, and uh, another is when there is a direct impact on the uh, rim of the orbit where there's a buckling in of the uh, orbital uh, floor. Uh, there are various varieties of uh, uh, blowout fractures. One is the medial wall can be involved, the floor can be involved in isolation, or uh, both the floor and the medial wall can be involved uh, in uh, combination as well. Uh, simple fractures like this, uh, where there's a small impact and uh, she has very subtle features like uh, restriction of movement and the diplopia in the up and uh, left case. Um, uh, we can see only on uh, uh, imaging, we can make out that there is a, a small fracture on the uh, floor of the orbit uh, with a classical trapdoor entrapment of the uh, intramuscular septae or uh, fat. Uh, on surgery, we can see identify the fracture, uh, uh, reposition the, reposit the uh, orbital contents, and uh, we can repair the floor of the orbit using a um, resorbable or a, a biointegratable uh, implant as a, as a barrier between the floor and the uh, fracture. So post surgery, we can see that her uh, uh, diplopia as well as restriction of uh, uh, eye movements have uh, been resolved. Uh, sometimes the blowout fractures can be large, involving uh, like in this case both the floor and the medial wall. Uh, post surgery, we can see that the uh, uh, floor and the medial wall is well reconstructed using a, a large titanium implant. Uh, which sits right in the posterior wedge, and we can see that it is sitting at the posterior wedge. And this is about six weeks post surgery, where both her enophthalmos, which was earlier there, as well as uh, diplopia, has been resolved. Uh, orbital zygomatic fractures, like I said earlier, is a classical tripod fracture. In this, uh, at least three out of the four uh, main fracture sites can be repaired, uh, like this uh, frontozygomatic. The uh, oral side from the uh, to the anterior orbit uh, uh, strut, as well as the uh, orbit, inferior orbital rim. So this can be done. Uh, usually this is enough, but sometimes uh, when after uh, repairing the uh, uh, Z, uh, ZMC fracture, there might be a residual floor fracture that needs to be repaired. Um, so there can be a residual fracture like this marked in uh, yellow line, and uh, this can be repaired using the other barrier implant like a biointegrator or bioresorbable implant. Uh, complex fractures where there's no clear pattern as such. Uh, in this case, uh, both the orbits are uh, fractured. It is a bilateral uh, ZMC fracture with uh, multiple uh, um, uh, bones which are hanging on both sides. Uh, you, can, you can see that there's no clear pattern as well how it is fractured. And the floor of the orbit is shattered as well as the medial one. So the middle wall floor also is uh, completely shattered. So the first thing is, first principles is to uh, uh, repair all the uh, vertical buttresses. And uh, then the orbital rims needs to be reattached back to the normal positions. And uh, orbital rim, uh, if your orbital rim is uh, repaired on the left side as well as the right side. Um, once uh, that is done, uh, we do a, uh, we request the left orbit using the a uh, large titanium implant. Uh, the left, uh, the right one was left alone because it was seen that the orbital fractures were minimal on the right side. Uh, so we did not put an implant on that side. We can see also this beautifully uh, repairs the posterior part of the orbit where there is no, uh, there is a fracture. Uh, Post-op scans, we see that it is sitting uh, right at the posterior ledge uh, and uh, it has, uh, uh, all the, even though it appears to be an open bite, all the bones are in the right positions. This is about six weeks out uh, from surgery. Uh, uh, this uh, this head model, uh, head model, uh, orbital head model uh, fracture, where the uh, impact is tight at the uh, bridge of the nose. Uh, and uh, the, you can see, uh, as an example, this is an annoying fracture where it fell down the stairs and hit the railing. Uh, we can see that the frontal bone is fractured as well as uh, because of the impact, both the floor and the medial wall on both orbits are involved uh, and this fracture. And uh, once the neurosurgery team has uh, did a bicoronal flap and uh, repaired the dural leak, uh, we went on to go to a, a frontal bone uh, uh, repair using a titanium mesh.
and once the fertile bond was repaired we went uh, we uh, repaired both the orbits right as well as left using a large uh, uh, titanium implants and uh, nose was uh, put into position once that i was in plaster of paris um, and after this post op scans where you can see that both orbits are adequately reconstructed as well as uh, giving a good profile to the nose as well um, this is about 2 weeks out after surgery and this is about 1 year after surgery this is a photo that the patient sent to me after a year of surgery uh this is a very interesting case where a 40 year old uh, had a fracture about 6 months back and he presented to us uh, uh, his primary uh, and it was operated elsewhere by another surgeon his primary concerns were diplopia in all cases and uh, deformed left side of the face uh, uh, on examination we see that there is a significant inophthalmos that is there on the left side Uh, there is an upper sulcus deformity, and the sulcus deformity was basically because of the uh, floor and medial wall fracture that you can see in the uh, CT scan. Uh, because of that, he also had a uh, cirrhosis and uh, hypoglobus on the left side. Then, um, along with that, he had headache, nausea, vomiting, as well as bradycardia when he looked up, mm, which involved uh, sympathetic uh, nervous system as well. So. Uh, I, when on further examination we see that there is a restriction of upward movement indicating that there is a inferior rectus entrapment uh, and also there is a we could not feel the inferior orbital rim on the left side uh, on ct scanning all these uh, clinical findings were uh, confirmed uh, where the medial wall floor was fractured the orbital inferior orbital rim also was uh, fractured and uh, mal malunited so uh, along with that he also had a left sided frontal sinus mucosal Uh, which was averting into the orbit and pushing the eyeball down so what we did was we did a virtual uh, uh, surgical planning uh, where we resolved the uh, thing and then we mirrored the normal side to the uh, affected side and then we reconstructed a, a 3d printed implant uh, using uh, the mirrored uh, orbit and uh, once that was done Uh, we uh, used a mock model to see if uh, the uh, prepared implant will sit properly in the orbit. And uh, once that was done, we went on for surgery, uh, where the ENT surgeon uh, did a endonasal endoscopic frontal sinus marsupialization, while I went on to do a, uh, a reconstruction using the patient-specific implant that we had 3D printed. So this is post-op scans where we see that the frontal sinus mucosal is completely resolved. as well as the orbit is adequately reconstructed uh, with the uh, um, orbits uh, the implant setting right in the posterior edge uh, this is post surgery where we can see it's all completely resolved uh, post surgery uh, he most of his symptoms uh, uh, was resolved except diplopia only in extreme up case um there is no other diplopia in any other case there is no hypoglobus there is good symmetry there is small amount of uh, inophthalmos that was residual inophthalmos is there but uh, it was quite minimal so patient was uh, quite happy with the outcome thank you very much now i'll be thank you dr ragraj for the wonderful presentation we now uh, go on to uh, dr chinmayi was the orbit and oculoplasty specialist and associate professor at uh, minto eye hospital and at netra dharma uh, she will be talking about eyelid reconstructions uh, thank you dr divya uh, my pre recorded talk Hi, is there this is dr tinmay i will be speaking on eyelid reconstruction at the outset i would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak on this particular topic as we all know eyelid reconstruction is necessary for all the lid defects that happen because of very uh, different reasons it could be like a congenital uh, coloboma or it could be because of a loss of tissue because of an extensive eyelid trauma or it could also be because of iatrogenic that is as a part of our treatment for lid tumors so colobomas the trauma the tumors and the most common type of eyelid reconstruction that we generally do is for the surgical resections for the tumors like this like we have different kind of uh, diseases that affect the eyelid and 
associated lid defects like benign and malignant tumors, large tumors, or orbital infections. Similarly, we have different kinds of defects that come, up, come from these kind of diseases. So we do have smaller lesions where we don't have to worry about margin clearance, where we have to worry about the margin clearance as in a BCC like this, extensive BCC with an extensive lid defect and an eccentrated socket that comes with an eccentration. So we have different kinds of uh, lid reconstructions that we have to do. The planning starts even before the reconstructive procedure. So before, when once you have the diagnosis in mind, preoperative planning as to what procedure that you would want to plan has to be explained to the patient. And at no cost, there should be a compromise with respect to the tumor clearance for want of cosmesis. And during the surgery, primary surgery, we avoid excessive cortex so that the graft pickup is better. And also we can plan lamellar surgeries when, when full thickness defects are large. And during the interim period, the wound has to be kept healthy. The important thing is to preserve the cornea uh, while we are waiting for the defect uh, margin clearance to be sought, particularly in the upper eyelid defects. It's very, very important that the cornea is protected. With the advent of frozen, uh, frozen uh, for the histopathology, wherever the facilities are available, this is not, of course, required. But when it is not available, we have to take care that the cornea is protected. Because fi finally, the cornea has to be healthy. So the goals is mainly the corneal protection, restoration of the integrity of the lid lamella, so as that we get both the anatomical and the functional outcome. And last is our cosmosis. So these are our, uh, are our important goals. And we have to reconstruct the anterior lamella, that is the skin, and the posterior lamella con containing the tarsus and the conjunctiva. And for that purpose, we, uh, for reconstruction, we can divide the defects into partial or full thickness based on the amount, less than one third, one third to half, more than half, or based on the thickness, whether it's a shallow or an intermediate or a deep defect, and based on the location, whether it is medial, central, or lateral. So some of the smaller uh, defects can go in for direct repair, while the larger need flaps, of which we have free flaps or the pedicle. So the basics are, before we start, we have to freshen the edges so that the graft take up is better. And we have to assess the size of the defect and the age of the patient. Younger patients, the issue is much more uh, tense. So it is more difficult. While older patient, patients, like in this case, the skin is very lax. So even larger defects can sometimes be directly approximated. And also make use of the maximum residual tissue whatever residual skin that is there may try to make use of that than harvest different tissue. So the addition of cantholysis and the release of the orbital septum will give uh, mobility to the upper lid, eyelid. So whenever possible, we can add that to uh, enhance our results and to conserve the tissue. So we can use this step ladder approach. And at all costs, lid notching Suture skin imbrication has to be avoided. Although the upper lid defect, it looks good, skin is interning here in this particular reconstruction. So that is causing recurrent corneal erosion. So we have to avoid the lid notching, suture and skin uh, imbrication by the skin. So what are the resources that we have for the anterior lamella, free skin or flaps? We have retroauricular skin, upper eyelid of the other eye, supraclavicular, inner arm and preauricular area. Personally, I prefer preauricular area because it gives a good match whenever the upper eyelid of the other eye is not available. Later, if a large skin is required, prefer the inner arm uh, because that is gets covered under the skin. Tarsal plate, we can either use the opposite eye tarsal plate, the cartilage of the ear septal or the palatal cartilage. For the conjunctiva, we can use the other eye conjunctiva or we can use the uh, buccal mucosal membrane or sometimes we also use the amniotic membrane graft. The procedures, I'll just, uh, laser affair is not actually a procedure, you just leave it to heal, particularly useful in lower eyelid and elderly people where you don't want to do a procedure, it heals very well. Direct opposition for uh, tissues which are uh, less than one third defect, uh, you can approximate directly with the vertical lid matrix stitch. Uh, even in this kind of uh, defects like a medial defect, we could do a direct opposition by lateral cantholysis and 
getting the lid, uh, mobilizing the lid to the medial side and get away with good results like this. With just the direct approximation with the uh, vertical mattress sutures. Now coming to the flaps, we can use the cutler bed or the huge flap for the central defects. For the medial defects, we can you for the upper lid, we can use the median forehead flap, and for the lower lid, we can use the nasal jugal flap. For the lateral defects, for the upper lid, the lateral forehead flap or the tensile semicircular rotation flap. For the lower lid, lateral defect, we can use the cheek rotation flap. So let's just go quickly into the cutler bed procedure. So it's a lower lid sharing procedure. Basically, the lower lid is shared to the upper eyelid along with the tarsal until flavor and the skin. So this is how it looks post-operatively. And I'm going to show you a procedure for an upper lid large melanoma like this, which we could get away with a very good cutler bed flap. And this is how the patient looks after the procedure. Hughes flap is similar to the cutler bed flap, just that it is the upper lid sharing to the lower lid. We can also use a bipedical flap uh, for this kind of large upper lid defects. So you can see that this particular patient, we have covered a large area. We have taken the tarsal plate from the uh, ear cartilage and you can see that the defect is, looks very neat and both with an anatomical and a functional closure. Glabular flap for the medial defects. So for this large uh, inverse uh, inverted keratosis, so this was the glabular flap that was done. And for the nasal, like uh, the medial defects, we can use the nasal jugal flap. So this is how the nasal jugal flap goes. The tensile cheek rotation flaps are useful for the lateral defects, both in the upper lid as well as in the lower lid. We can do a rotational flap, and this is how the defect, which was because of the mebumian uh, cell carcinoma in a very young patient with a tight lid, looked like. So sometimes we do have both lids which are deficient, as in this case of a ablepharon, and we use multiple uh, skin flaps and stage procedure. And finally, this patient looked like this after the third year follow-up. The larger tumors with orbital invasion and other things will have to go with the customized processes to power up that defect. So a good reconstruction, we, we need to have a pre-operative planning, counseling, proper selection of the procedure. And with all that, our main aim is a good anatomical and a functional closure. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Oh, thank you, Dr. Divya. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chinmay, for your excellent presentation. Uh, now we'll go on to the next uh, topic. That is the use of implants in oculoplasty. Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to thank the organizers of COSCON, uh, Dr. Elan and Dr. Roshmi, for giving me this opportunity. My topic is the use of implants in oculoplasty. So the, mainly the oculoplasty implants are used in the socket and in the nasolacrimal system. So in the socket, it's mainly used for volume and expansion. It's used to restore the normal integrity and the anatomy. And it's also used for cosmosis in acquired anophthalmos. Uh, in the lacrimal system, it's used to overcome problems of epiphora and the obstruction of the nasolacrimal duct. In facial palsy, we use it to overcome the issue of leg of thalmus. In the nasolacrimal system, these are small diameter tubes which are placed to maintain the patency. Initially, a silver wire was placed first in 1932, following which various implants have been used like silk, nylon, polyethylene, etc. Mainly, it is indicated following trauma, infection, malignancy, thermal injury, post chemo, or post radiation. The lacrimal implants can be classified based on the, the system it is uh, used in, like bicanalicular or monoclonal, whether the entire nasal lacrimal drainage is, is uh, intubated, like in the Crawford stent or the Kanaka lacryflow stent, or the Rettling stent or the pigtail donut stent. The monoclonal stents, you intubate only a single canaliculus like the Monaka stent, and the Jones tube bypasses the whole system. So the Crawford stent is, uh, used, uh, it has metal probes and bulbs on the distal end, and it is a silicon uh, rod. Uh, it, it in the end, the ligating suture within the nose helps to locate it later on, 
uh, for easier removal. And these stents can be left in place for uh, six weeks to three months. The Rettling stent is a, uh, has an introducer with a hollow lumen and a stillet. The rigidity of the stillet allows it to enter the nasal acrimal system. Once inside, the stillet is removed and the end of the bicanal plus stent is advanced to the hollow lumen. The pigtail stent, it involves the uh, upper, lower and common canaliculus. The pigtail probe is used to pass the stent and this uh, stent you can make out by the presence of this nylon wire in one end of the, along the stent. It's mainly used in trauma traumatic canalicular lacerations. The Kaneka lacry flow stent intubates the entire lacrimal system. It has thin intracanalicular system with a large diameter tubing at the end so that it is self-retaining and it has steel bougies for insertion. The monaca or the mini monaca cannulates a single canaliculus. It's a silicon stent with a plug or a cap in one end so that no suturing is required and it's self-retaining. It's commonly used after trauma. The mini monaca is a smaller version of it. The Jones tube undergone various uh, modifications but is still yet to have its own uh, name. It's a Pyrex glass tube and it helps to bypass the uh, entire canalicular system. Uh, it is passed from the conjunctival cardiac sac through a bony ostium and to the nose. But maintaining this Jones tube comes with its own set of complications. <laughs> So we have the anophthalmic or the socket implants. Now, these are usually uh, placed in an uh, acquired anophthalmus or in a congenital anophthalmus, where in 1583, the removal of the eye was first introduced by George Barish. And subsequently, there have been a lot of implants which have been used uh, and undergone a lot of changes to help socket uh, cosmosis and expansion. The orbit can implants can be classified whether it's integrated, semi-integrated, uh, whether it has bio-integrated or biogenic, depending on whether it involves the, it gets integrated into the orbital structures or the, uh, and is uh, coupled with the overlying processes or not. So the non-integrated commonly used ones are the PMMA spheres and the bio-integrated commonly used are the porous polyethylene or the bioceramic aluminum oxide implants. But the non-integrated, they can be used uh, by wrapping with sclera or they can be placed as it is. Uh, chances of migration are more when it's not wrapped, but it's covered well with the overlying conjunctiva and has no connection to the processes. Hence, the motility is less as compared to the integrated implants. The semi-integrated implants are the implants within the socket which are completely covered by the overlying conjunctiva, but then the irregular surface allows some amount of coupling and integration, like the Allen's implant, the Iowa implant, or the universal implant. There's also the magnetic system of coupling where the overlying processes and the implant both have a magnet in them. The bio-integrated implant or the modern day implants are the uh, made up of coralline hydroxyapatite, which is the bio eye, or the synthetic porous polyethylene or the bioceramic aluminum oxide implants. These are biocompatible, allow the integration by uh, ingrowth of the fibrovascular tissue through these pores and they're non-toxic and non-allergenic, but the chances of extrusion and infection are slightly higher in these implants. Now, they can also be directly attached to the overlying processes through a pegging system, which improves motility and gives a more lifelike uh, quality to the overlying processes because of increased range of movements. Now, biogenic implants like the dermis fat graft are autologous and can be used to augment the volume and surface area with minimal risk of infection. It doesn't need any storage or any preparation. This dermis increases the graft vascularity and decreases the incidence of fat atrophy. Implants for orbital fractures are used mainly to support the orbital contents, retain its shape. Uh, they are also for, uh, they need to conform along the facial structures. They should not have sharp edges. Uh, they are inert, they have low risk of infection. They should not uh, be easily um, migrating or be extruded out. Then if they're uh, 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 autologous, then we should make sure the donor site morbidity is less and they should also be economical and easily available to the patient. Now they can also be classified based on uh, various uh, types, whether it's autologous, allergenic, or whether it's alloplastic or bioresorbable. The uh, titanium mesh is a commonly used orbital implant in flow fractures. These can also be composite along with porous polyethylene partly. And these can be easily bendable and uh, placed along the uh, contour of the floor of the orbit.
The other implants are the titanium plates and screws and also the polis polyethylene sheets and also the calvarial bone grafts. We have some cosmetic implant, uh, composite implants, which are used mainly in congenital anophthalmos to expand the orbit and help the growing uh, orbit to uh, maintain cosmosis. The hydrophilic osmotic expander consists of two polymers, the methyl methacrylate and the N-vinyl pyrolidone. This uh, expands to 12 times its normal volume when exposed to liquid. Then we have the alpha sphere orbital implant, which is used in acquired anophthalmia, which has a white spongy anterior layer and a clear gel posterior layer with a muslin mesh in between. Then we have uh, the platinum chain implants and the gold weight implants. These are used in the treatment of facial palsy. They are implanted in the upper lid and it's indicated in eyelid retraction and lag of thalmus. So these are the variety of implants. I'm sure uh, we have learned a lot and there's much more to learn. Uh, but what's more important is that the economics and, uh, of the, and the affordability of the patient and then uh, its usage. So I'd like to thank you all for patient hearing and uh, also the COSCON team once again for a good conference. Thank you. Coming to the... Uh last and uh, important keynote address of this session. Uh, I'd like to doctor, uh, welcome Dr. Milan Nayak uh, for the uh, keynote address. He, uh, uh, serves from uh, the prestigious LV Prasad Institute, Hyderabad. And he's going to be talking to us on the current concepts of uh, thyroid eye disease. So we welcome you uh, to this course con conference. Thank you. Hello everyone. It is a distinct honor and pleasure to be a part of the COSCON 2021. I would like to thank Dr. Raj Shekhar, Dr. Krishna Prasad, and also Dr. Ellen Kumaran for this kind invite. And of course, Roshmi Gupta and the entire team of Oculoplasty Association from Karnataka State. My topic for today is current concepts in thyroid eye disease. And I would like to take you all through some key punch lines which will be useful for every ophthalmologist when they are managing a patient of thyroid eye disease. I would like to thank all my teachers, all the alumni and especially Varshita in doing most of the thyroid research that we have done at LV Prasad Eye Institute. Thyroid eye disease is an immunological disease and the concepts are constantly evolving and I'm going to divide this in the form of endocrine perspective, identifying active disease, what are the investigations, how do we manage active disease, and how do we manage stable disease. One needs to understand the difference between the systemic disease, which is hyper or hypothyroidism, versus the thyroid eye disease. The systemic disease may be persisting for years and the patient may not have an eye disease. However, when the eye disease begins, we have to label that as thyroid eye disease because as an ophthalmologist, your concern is primarily about their eye condition. Hyperthyroidism is more of a concern for an ophthalmologist because of the use of antithyroid drugs, radioiodine, and even thyroidectomy. So learning number one is from endocrine perspective, hyperthyroidism is more linked to ophthalmology because of radioiodine the sudden control of T3, T4, and the anesthetic complications that could be possible. To manage the disease, we need to understand the concept of active and inactive thyroid eye disease. So for the first one to one and a half years since the onset of eye disease, the disease is labeled as active. This is the time during which all inflammatory signs such as conjunctival congestion, chemosis, motility restriction, proptosis, would change based on the immunological state. Once this is over, the patient enters the inactive phase of the disease, which remains so for the rest of his or her life. It is during this phase that we need to do corrective measures. So how is this clinical activity measured? Moritz was the one who described a simple scoring method to measure clinical activity. So he gave seven points. First two are about pain pain at rest behind the eye or pain on eye movements. The other two are about redness, redness of the eyelid, congestion of the conjunctiva, which has to be diffused. The other three are about swelling. 
swelling of the eyelid, swelling of the conjunctiva, which is chemosis, and swollen carinca. And out of seven, you can represent what is the clinical activity score of a patient in a given visit. But we also need to be aware of what we call as pseudo activity. Congestion which is associated with keratitis. Similarly, congestion which is only limited to the palpable fissure should not be labeled as activity. Finally, episcleral dilated vessels are a sign of congestive orbitopathy because of the increased back pressure in the orbit and is not an immunological redness which needs treatment with steroids. So the next pointer is classifying whether the disease is active or inactive is the first step in the management of a thyroid eye disease. Talking about investigations, of course we would examine the patient thoroughly, vision assessment and color vision, a complete eye checkup, exophthalmometry and clinical activity scoring is routinely done in all patients for all visits. In addition, you might want to do visual fields and imaging. Thyroid eye disease is a clinical diagnosis and a B scan or a CT scan is not necessary to make the diagnosis. Are measurements required? Absolutely not because the muscle once thickened is likely to stay so. So when a CT scan required for diagnosis? Number one, when the diagnosis is suspect, if the disease is unilateral or if there is compressive neuropathy that is suspected or third, if the patient is being planned for a surgery. For dysthyroid optic neuropathy, we use Barrett's muscle index as well as Nugent's grading scale for the management of this condition. Between MRI and CT, I prefer a CT scan because it simultaneously gives me bony data which is often required for the subsequent surgical management. So how do we manage the active disease? Most patients, which is 90%, would require just observation and lubricants. Steroids are given when there is dysthyroid optic neuropathy or when the inflammatory signs around the eye are cosmetically objectionable as you can see in this first picture. In addition to these, during the active phase one might have to manage lid retraction if the patient is bothered by it and that can be done with either botulinum toxin, a filler injection, tarsorophy or tyramcinolone acetonide injection. As I said, most cases are mild and they require just lubricants to quit smoking. You can add selenium to their diet. Head and elevation while sleeping really reduces the congestion that they have around the eye. And a regular follow-up to see the progress of proptosis as well as eyelid positions. Good control of thyroid serology will obviously be done by your endocrinology colleague. Moderate to severe thyroid eye disease will be managed by immunotherapy with steroids, which could either be oral or intravenous and rarely intraoral. Steroid sparing agents can be used in patients who have a relative or absolute contraindication to steroids and rarely external beam radiotherapy might be used. It is known that the IV therapy with steroids is better than the oral therapy. It is very important to understand that steroids do not reverse the disease. Unfortunately, many ophthalmologists and endocrinologists believe so. Steroids only reduce the inflammatory signs. It does not reverse the proptosis or the lid retraction. The steroids merely fast forward the active phase so that you can land into an active phase sooner so that you can start managing the disease surgically. So the indications for steroids during active phase, in my personal opinion, is compressive optic neuropathy and disfiguring inflammation. There is a definite role of tarsorophy in the active phase. Compressive optic neuropathy can be managed either with intravenous methylprednisone or a medial wall decompression. So in a nutshell, the active disease is managed by just waiting out the 12 to 18 month period with watchful observation, topical lubricants, and steroids if indicated. Finally, coming to the stable disease, we have a classic paradigm of managing the proptosis followed by strabismus, thirdly, eyelid conditions, and finally, cosmetic concerns. All these patients have 6'6 vision, but look at the way their face has changed after the thyroid eye disease. Today, over 95% of patients seek surgery for thyroid eye disease not because their vision is affected 
but because their looks have changed drastically and they cannot recognize themselves in the mirror anymore. I use this slide to describe to the patients what we do in thyroid decompression. So your eyeball is the scoop of the ice cream. We just widen the bony socket or the cone so that the eye settles into the socket. Orbital decompression is performed in the inactive stage of the disease. For approaches, we have either endonasal approach, transantral approach, transcarenkular approach to the medial wall, or you have an ab externo or ab interno orbital approaches for the lateral wall. For the lateral wall, we have the classic incisions of eyelid crease or a Burkiris lateral canthotomy incision. Personally, I prefer the eyelid crease because it is hidden. Here are some pictures of a patient undergoing a lateral wall decompression through an eyelid crease approach. Orbicularis is incised, we reach the orbital rim and we finally take an incision around the orbital rim which extends over three to four clock hours just lateral to the supraorbital neurovascular bundle. We then enter the orbit by lifting the periorbita and that is where we would start our drilling process. So we start a drilling at the orbital rim and we extend it towards the superior orbital fissure. That is the area that we would be drilling here. The anterior half and the posterior half of the lateral wall is then drilled to get the maximum space within the orbit. Floor decompression is easy and the most common approach is transconjunctival incision which can either be postseptal or preceptal. Here are a few photographs of how we reach the orbital floor transconjunctively by spreading the Stevens scissors into the orbit. You can literally reach the floor within seconds. Similarly, the medial wall can be reached through a transcarenkular incision. Transcarenkular incision allows us to land right behind the lacrimal sac so you bypass the lacrimal apparatus and only decompress the ethmoidal components of the medial wall. These are my preferred approaches for uh, orbital decompression. For the lateral wall, I prefer an eyelid freeze incision. For the medial wall, transcarenkular. And for the floor, a tra inferior transconjunctival. So all the three incisions remain hidden so that you can have excellent cosmetic results. Here are several examples of patients who underwent one, two or three wall decompressions showing you pre and post operative photographs of the reduction in proptosis as well as the eyelid position. For extreme cases which are above eight millimeters, we can only do so much with three wall decompression However, if we want to have a further reduction, we may have to advance the maxillary zygomatic complex of the bony anatomy in order to cover the eye more. Same decompression philosophy can be used for non-thyroid causes such as unilateral high myopia as seen in this lady where we did a fat decompression along with a lower eyelid retractor release to give us symmetry. Next comes strabismus surgery for which we would involve a strabismologist and third paradigm is eyelid surgery where we perform, perform correction of the upper eyelid retraction as well as lower eyelid retraction in a systematic manner. Last comes cosmetic treatment in the form of blepharoplasty, fillers, botulinum toxin for the glabular lines and so on. The two recent advances in thyroid eye disease worth mentioning is the use of piezoelectric technology which only targets the mineralized tissue which is bone and soft tissue is spared. So this is wonderful for floor decompression where we can preserve the infraorbital nerve and therefore the cheek sensations. Navigation guided technology has changed the way we can do decompression safely especially in the deep lateral wall as well as the posterior parts of medial wall decompression. So to summarize, we looked at the endocrine perspective, how to identify active disease, investigations in thyroid eye disease, management of active disease and management of stable disease. Thank you, sir, uh, for enlightening us on the latest and current concepts in thyroid eye disease. 
it was a wonderful presentation and i'm sure we've all learned a lot today does Thank anybody so want much. to say anybody has any questions uh, i had a question uh, do you Dr. Dilia, do you use any other, I mean, what are the uh, orbital implants that you use? Uh, have you tried different uh, implants uh, in the orbits for the enucleation? Uh, I commonly use the PMMA implant with either the scleral uh, wrapping because uh, most of my patients economically cannot really afford anything else. So... PMMA with scleral wrapping or uh, vicral mesh is what are commonly used. Uh, uh, but is there any uh, value in any other, uh, I mean, using another uh, implant other than the regular PMMA? Uh, if you've seen the paper uh, by Dr. Santosh Anavar where he compares the two, uh, there's not much difference really between using uh, PMMA or the hydroxyapatite implant. So, yeah, I guess uh, PMMA is as good, especially in our scenario, it's as good. But, uh, yeah, most of my experience is with PMMA. Do you want to say, add anything to that? Anybody else wants to add anything to that? I... I tried a lot of other implants also, but uh, I think uh, in the end, uh, uh, MMA is the uh, one which is best. So it, uh, <laughs> it tempts any other implant either. Yeah. Anybody else has any other questions? Dr. Chinmay, you want to say anything? Uh, yeah, no, just that even I'm a big fan of PMMA implants. One is the cost, and as you all. Uh, agree with the fact that there, there are no major uh, issues. Uh, yeah, I think it's more about the way we close, uh, like layered closure, the posterior tenons, the anterior tenons, and the content fiber. With the uh, suture with a good tensile strength is what matters. Some of the complications that we handle, uh, we referred from other places or something, they, they may have used a 60 vehicle to close. So, I think that is the important thing to use the right suture and uh, a layer closure. Yes, and also uh, when Dr. you do Mary, primary. If you are here, uh, could you highlight any of the things that uh, I, I think, Divya? Uh, yeah. Any, any other thing to discuss in any of the other topics? Oh, I think it's. Uh, I'm okay. Yeah. If anybody else has anything to say, then <laughs> yeah. we've finished early, I think. Okay, I think we can call it today. There are no questions from the audience. Uh, one more thing, Dr. Chinmay, do you use a yeah. lot of, uh, uh, do you prefer to use lid, lid sharing uh, uh, flaps or do you uh, like to keep it uh, open. I mean, uh, uh, the other other flaps so that you can keep the eye open, or okay, doesn't matter. Yeah. Depends on the uh, needs. Yeah. So gen generally, uh, for the cosmetic thing, uh, the results with the lid sharing flaps, both with the cutler bed and loops flap, I find it very good in my hands, and uh, I would prefer that over the other flaps. Uh, yeah, I generally I prefer that. Although the pay, for the patient, it is definitely an inconvenience for that one month, uh, six weeks that it is closed. Somehow cut, I don't like cutler bear that much. I tried a few, <laughs> it, it, okay. I didn't get uh, optimum results. So uh, I uh, I usually avoid uh, for cutler bear, but cutler that's bear? just a personal okay. preference. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, otherwise it, it works really very well. And uh, after a while, uh, we, we can't even make out except for the eyelashes that are missing. It looks very neat. And the lower lid also mm. looks fairly nice. So I prefer that. Uh, yeah, think, uh, so for me, the, what was happening was that uh, when you use the yeah. lower lid, it is uh, yeah. once we do the uh, flap division, the yeah. lower lid is actually a uh, little recessed because of the Sorry. constant food and yes. uh, little yes. recessed. This causes yes. that little scleral show and sometimes uh, it can Sorry. cause uh, little entropion also. 
so yeah. so i mean i i did a few but uh, now mm-hmm. i've uh, completely uh, i don't prefer usually yeah Uh, one of the things that I, I don't prefer is a median forehead flap because the skin tends to be fairly thick and that all that lymphedema uh, remains for a very long time. So that is one, mm. uh, one flap which I don't really like to do and also the midline scar that it gives. So that, that is one thing which I hate to do. Yeah, that's another thing. What do you de- how do you deal with uh, lymphedema? Uh, maybe post-trauma or post-surgery? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, particularly post, post this mucor also, we have been having a lot of cases. Uh, uh, like, mm. So generally, for now, I'm just dealing with the uh, massage and that only. Uh, anything else that you practice for the lymphedema? I Usually mean, it's a uh, short time, but uh, that time is very, it looks... No, but that bad. thing remains, uh, I mean, that little bit of uh, puffiness on that... Sorry. Uh, yeah. that delay uh, especially the especially this uh, lateral canthal wounds correct uh, those are the ones which cause the lymphedema uh, yeah. uh, i in, i've had a little success with uh, using uh, five fu on the scars so okay. on the, the lateral canthus uh, mm-hmm. i have uh, it in a few it is uh, moderate Uh, and i also give a little bit of massage uh, along with silicone okay. sheets so that it will scar a little uh, that sometimes helps also so but uh, uh, it's a little difficult to see which one will uh, work or not mean yes i think mainly because of the lymph uh, drainage is uh, inhibited because of the scar formation there so i think that is why the clearance is not happening yes I think we are done today. Yeah, I think uh, we can close the session if there are no more questions. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Thank you. It was a wonderful yeah. session. Yeah, it was a wonderful session. <laughs> nice uh-huh. to see all of you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Millen. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Millen. Bye. Bye. Uh, Karthi, I, I guess you can end the session. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.